Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first session of Learning Dita Live 2020. I'm Alan Pringle of Scriptorium, and I will be moderating the first two sessions of today. Learning Dita Live is brought to you by Scriptorium, the content strategy experts. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped, company, has helped companies structure content. We want to thank the sponsors of Learning Dead Alive. Without this, this event would not be possible. During the webcast, attendees will be muted, but we still want to hear from you. If you would, take a moment to find the questions chat module, and you can type your questions in there throughout the throughout the seminar. If you would, at the end of the presentation, there will be a Q&A session, and during then, look for a link in the questions module for a survey to fill out. We very much want your feedback on this event. Our first session is Introduction to Dita with my colleague from Scriptorium, Simon Bates. Simon, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Alan. Hey there. So I am going to hand over the presentation to you so you can show your slides. All right, just waiting for the prompt. And I don't see the prompt. There it is, okay. Great, I see your slides. All right, great, let's get started. Hello, and welcome to DITA Overview. This session is designed for those who are unfamiliar with DITA. We will cover the basics of what DITA is and how to use it to structure your content. I'm Simon Bate. I'm a senior technical consultant with Scriptorium Publishing. I've been with Scriptorium since 2007. My areas of expertise include text markup, programming for text formatting, and crafting other documentation tools. My responsibilities for Scriptorium include data architecture, data use, and data training. I also develop transforms for data, which we'll look at in this presentation, and data specializations, which I'll also talk about. I've written and contributed to many of the courses you'll find in learningdata.com. So what is DITA? DITA is an acronym for the Darwin Information Typing Architecture. We'll see how Darwin is involved in DITA in just a little bit. Darwin is a, DITA is an open standard of XML that was originally created by IBM and donated to OASIS in 2005. DITA is an XML-based tool-independent way to create, organize, and manage content DITA is a way of creating structure, topic, topic, sorry. <laughs> DITA is a way of creating structured topic-based content that exists separately from its formatting. Let's break down what that means. Starting with the concept of structured authoring. Structured authoring is a workflow that lets you define and enforce consistent organization of information in documents. In an unstructured environment, the hierarchy and organization of your content may be defined by a style guide and perhaps enforced by a human editor, but there's no way or no automated way to ensure that authors follow it. For example, nothing prevents you from starting a chapter with a level two head. In a structured authoring environment, such as DITA, the elements used to mark up your content their hierarchy and organization are all strictly defined and enforced by a set of rules. And those rules are then enforced by the tools that you use. Now let's talk about topic-based authoring. Topic-based authoring is creating content where one file or unit contains information about a single topic or answers a single question so that these topics can be assembled into documents for publication. 
This is different from chapter-based or book-based authoring, such as you'll find in FrameMaker or Word, where a single file may cover multiple different topics. Topic-based authoring is inherent in the structure of DITA. Finally, let's look at separating content from authoring. Oops, sorry, <laughs> separating content from formatting. <laughs> in desktop publishing, based authoring tools. The formatting and appearance of your content is tied to the content itself. Content is created so that what you see is what you get in the final output. In DITA, you create and tag the content. Then the formatting is applied separately and automatically when the output is generated. It's important for gen this is important for generating different outputs, for example, HTML or PDF from the same sources. So when you're writing the content, instead of what you see is what you get, what you see is only one option for how the final deliverable might look. So now we've gone over what DITA is, let's talk about some of the reasons you might want to use DITA and some of the benefits it offers. Being an open standard makes DITA flexible. DITA can be used with a variety of different tools for authoring, editing, formatting, and storing content. If your business goals change or your contents need change, being in DITA makes it easier to go to a different tool set while keeping the same source content. The elements used to mark up your DITA content give your content semantic value. That is, every piece of content in DITA is tagged with an element. Semantic value means that the tag surrounding each piece of content has meaning, such as paragraph, step, hazard statement, and so on. So both your authors and your authoring and publishing tools know what kind of information is contained in each tag. Tagging your content so that it has semantic value um, also helps with search and filtering. Topic-based content is easier to reuse. Individual topics can be used and reused in any order in any number of different documents. In DITA, the topics are organized in maps, which are much like a table of contents. The map allows you to specify the order and hierarchy of your topics. A reusable topic addresses a single idea or question. It contains enough information to stand on its own, and it doesn't assume any context about what information comes before it or after it. And separating your content for the formatting makes it easier to produce multiple outputs. If you're producing more than one type of output, for example, PDF, HTML, and EPUB, using DITA allows you to apply different formatting to the same set of source files, which means all your outputs will be consistent with each other. If you're producing multiple output types, but you don't have that separation of content and formatting, that means you'll have to duplicate the content and reformat for each output type, which involves far more time and effort and introduces the possibility of errors. The markup language of DITA includes a predefined set of elements. You can use these elements just as they are, but you can also specialize them for your content needs. This is where Darwin comes into the idea of DITA, because Darwin wrote about the specialization of species. In DITA, we talk about the specialization of DITA elements. Whoops. Specialization is the process of creating new data elements based on the structure of existing ones. Specialization lets an information architect create elements that fit your organization better than what is provided in data by default. This might include creating new elements to contain different types of information that are not defined in data and give them semantic value. Creating new names for elements that are more relevant for authors or creating elements to contain certain information in a specific order. The level of specialization you do depends on your needs. You may need to use most data elements as they are and only specialize one or two elements, or you may need to specialize most or all of the elements your authors will use. You can specialize at the topic level, you can specialize elements, and you can actually spe specialize attributes in data. However, important to know, Specialization does add to the cost of your data implementation. You have to balance the value that's gained from your specialization against the cost of implementing and maintaining your specializations. 
this the specialization also has to be available to your editing tool, to your transformations, and to your CCMS, that is your component content management system. And specializations may require additional training for your authors. I did a topic as a building block of content. One of the fundamental principles of DITA is different types of content require different containers or topic types. That way, the elements in the topic can be specific to the element being described. The DITA standard includes types of topics intended for different purposes. The topic types contribute to the semantic value of your content. The topic type tells you what kind of information is contained within it, just as other DITA elements do. DITA defines a number of uh, basic topic types, and of course you can specialize these, but the common ones that you're going to use are topic, concept, task, reference, and glossary entry. Well, let's take a closer look at each of these topic types. All DITA topic types are related to a common or generic topic type. This topic is the basis of all specializations. And within a, a DITA topic, you will find some common elements. You will find there's a topic, which is the container element, the title, of course, the title of the topic, and the body, which is where the content of your topic exists. So here's an example of a topic. On the left, we have some basic content. And on the right, we see the same content with DITA tags. We start with the topic element which is just a container element that tells us that this is a topic. Then there's a title element, which contains a title, wild duck species. And then we have the body element, which contains all the content in this topic. In this example, the body element only contains a single paragraph of content. This generic topic type is used as the basis for all other data topic types. It's specialized into a number of different topic types, each of which holds a special type of information but this basic structure you will still see in all of those topic types. So when I'm testing ideas, I might use the generic topic type, but when I'm writing, I'll use a much more specialized topic type, such as concept, task, reference, or glossary entry. We'll go over those types next. Concept topic provides conceptual information. It answers the question, why? It provides background information about a subject that the reader needs to know. Concepts usually contain paragraphs of text and lists, but they can also include notes, tables, graphics, figures, various things needed to understand the basis, the, the ideas behind a particular subject. Some of the common tasks, some of the common concept elements that you'll encounter are the concept, which is, of course, the container element, the title, which is the title for the concept, con body, which is the concept equivalent of the body element, P, which is a paragraph, note, UL or OL, which are unordered list, which might be a bulleted list, or ordered list, which might be a numbered list, um, images, or tables. So here's an example of a concept topic in both the output on the left and the tagged content on the right. This is the exact same content we saw in the previous example of the generic topic type, but now it's tagged as a concept, which means it has more semantic value. We can look at the concept tag and know that this is conceptual information. The next topic type is the task. A task contains step-by-step -step procedural information. Task usually answers the question, how? It includes step-by-step -step instructions to complete a procedure. Each step contains a required command element and can also give other clarifying information, such as examples, graphic, notes, and a level of sub-steps. When you create technical content, it's often very heavy on tasks, so this is something you, you will get very familiar with when using DITA. DITA actually offers two different task types. First, 
is a strict task type, and this requires a specific set of elements in a specific order. For most tasks, this is the appropriate form to use. This is also a general task, and this is we call this also a loose task, which allows much more relaxed structure and allows steps to contain much more varied content. The, the general task is appropriate for tasks that require much more flexibility. Almost all of the strict task elements are available in the general task. And we'll use a strict task exam, strict task for our example, which we'll take a look at after we look at the common task elements. So the common task elements include task, again, the task is the container element, the title, the task body, so now you're getting an idea of how the structure often looks and how the name of some of the elements base, are based on topic type. Then within task body, we may have steps, which is a sequence of actions. We may have a step, which is an individual action, and then CMD or command, and this is the actual action that the user takes. And here's a strict task example. And I'm, I'm afraid that um, room requires us not to, we can't have any more than one step. So this is rather a, a silly little example, but this is a task with a single step. And again, the output is on the left and the data tags are on the right. And just with a, just like other topic examples, we've got a container element, task, a title, and a body. And in this case, the container element is called task and the body is task body. The task has only one step. We use the step elements to contain a set of steps. Step element for an individual step and the required command element inside that step. Using a task topic with steps gives us a much more semantic way to tag our content than using, say, a generic topic or even a concept within an ordered list. The output might look the same, but the task topic gives the content much more semantic value. The next topic type is a reference. The reference topic type contains reference information and answers the question, what, which, how many, or how much, or similar, similar things like that. The reference topic typically contains descriptive facts, such as the syntax of a command, the syntax of an API function call, perhaps a table listing operational characteristics and tolerances of a device, or a table identifying items on a software screen. Reference topics do not include steps or background information. This is the role of the task or concept type. Reference topics are similar to dictionary entries in that they provide facts only. Common reference elements are the reference, again, the container, the title, the ref body, a section, which is a subdivision within the reference topic with an optional title, and then you might encounter a table, a figure, uh, properties, usually it's a, a table of properties, or perhaps a, um, a syntax diagram. And here's an example of a reference topic. In this case, it's a reference for a command called tnav, and we see the title of, on the left, we see the title of this topic, and then below the title, we see the syntax described, so we have this dash tnav, which is the command, and then perhaps a variable um, or replaceable set of text where the user types something, and then an optional parameter called tView. So on the, on the right, what we're seeing is we see, again, the reference container, we have the title, we have our reference body, and then within the reference body, we have a ref sin. And within the ref sin is the actual syntax description, which contains the tnav, the name as a variable, and then other properties. A glossary entry defines a single term and answers a question, what does this mean? Glossary topics contain a term and a definition. Some of the common glossary elements are gloss entry, which again is the container type or the topic type, 
a gloss term, which is the word being defined, and gloss def, which is a def definition of the glossary term. You'll notice in here, in the glossary entry uh, topic, that there is no title element. Well, in the glossary entry, the gloss term is actually a specialization of the title element. So here's an example of a glossary entry. We have the um, so the, we have a glossary entry containing um, we have sorry we have gloss entry element here containing our actual glossary entry. We have gloss term which contains the word duck, and then gloss def which contains a single paragraph which describes what a duck is. So now that we've covered topics, let's talk about maps. Digitopics can stand on their own, but content in one topic often has relationships to other topics. A map describes the sequence and hierarchy of topics for a deliverable. Map files are how you organize your content for delivery. They're like a table of contents. They create sequence and hierarchy among topics. When you generate a PDF file or a help system from a map file, your readers see the topics in the order and hierarchy established by the map file. You don't need to add all of your available to topics to your map file, just the ones you want to use in a specific deliverable. Also, you can include the same data topic in multiple map files which is an example of reuse in data. The elements that you'll encounter in a map are different from the elements you'll encounter in a topic. First, at the top level, we have a map element, which is, again, the container object. And then we have top ref, topic ref elements, which provide links to, other, to specific topics, and map ref elements, which provide map uh, links to other maps or submaps. So in a map file, use the topic ref element to provide, to provide a link to a specific topic. Here's an example of a map using topic refs. So in this example, we've got a map called wild ducks with two topic refs, one to a topic called wild duck species, or C underscore wild, wild underscore ducks dot data, and then another topic ref to a to a tip did a topic in a file called t underscore watching wild underscore docs dot data. Now you'll notice that those are file names and on the left you actually see the titles. Well when this data content is processed into the output your data formatter actually goes and finds the title in each of those topics and uses the title of those topics in the table of contents that you see here on the left. So, in addition to linking to topics, you can reference other map files inside the map file. In this approach, a subordinate map or submap is usually a collection of related content, which means then you can reuse that submap in many other maps. So here we see more or less the same example, but as a um, as a map containing two map refs. And in this case, we have a uh, we have a map ref. To, a, uh, to another map called M underscore wild ducks. And then there's another, the second map ref that points to another data map called M domestic ducks. You'll notice on the left, you see now not just, uh, not just the name of those, um, those maps, but you actually see the names of the content or the titles of the content within those. So the wild ducks actually then points to wild duck species and watching wild ducks. And those titles, again, are pulled into the table, table into the table of contents by your data processor. Now that we've covered topics and maps, let's talk about another important aspect of data, which is metadata. Metadata is higher data or data about data. For example, a word processing application may have document properties which tell you who created a file and on what date it was last modified. But 
the author and modification date in the document properties are not part of the text that is displayed. These document properties are metadata about the document itself. In XML content, metadata lets you classify and manipulate information. In DITA, you can assign metadata to maps, topics, individual elements, and more. So let's take a look at how content creators use metadata. Content creators can use this metadata to classify information in a number of ways. You can label information with a type, such as white paper or proposal. You could associate your information with a specific product number. You can indicate a user level, such as beginner, intermediate, or expert. You can indicate the audience for the content, such as manager or employee. You can provide status information for the, for the topic, such as draft, review, or final. You could provide an expiration date for when the information is no longer valid. And you can indicate the language that is used in the content. So after you assign the metadata to your content, you or your reader can use it to then find your information more effectively. You can, it can support a governance effort, such as you can control when information is made public or removed from a website. You can personalize information, so your reader could request information that's targeted for beginners. The metadata can be used to filter information for different delivery variants. For example, you might have some um, you want, might want to generate one output for Windows and another output for a Macintosh. And you can use it to manage project status. When you're coming up with a content strategy, it should always include a metadata structure, metadata strategy, which takes into account how both your content creators and content consumers will use your metadata. In DITA, metadata is stored in special elements or in attributes to any element. You can add DITA metadata to both topics and maps. Your organization or your DITA setup may require additional metadata using other attributes. For example, the XML lang attribute is commonly used to include metadata about the language the content is written in. DITA defines a number of attributes, but you can also use specialization to add other attributes. And as a general rule, your authors, your readers, do not see the metadata. They might see the results of filtering or use the metadata when they search the content. So how do you assign the metadata? You can assign metadata at several different locations. You can assign it at the topic level, at the element level, or at the map level. So here's a topic level metadata example. So all data topics require one piece of metadata, which is an ID attribute enclosed in the topic containers element. You can see here we have topic and then ID equals domestic underscore ducks. So domestic underscore ducks is the ID for this topic. These IDs are often assigned automatically by authoring tools or by a content management system. And you can also assign IDs to other elements, for example, you can put an ID attribute on a table, and that way you can cross-reference that table. Or you might put an ID on a figure, which then allows you to cross-reference that figure. But most authoring tools automatically assign IDs to the element, add a, add, assign IDs to elements that might be cross-referenced. In DITA, topics provide a prologue element in which you can store metadata for the entire topic. You can see this here. So some useful um, information in the, uh, some useful prologue elements might include an author or crit dates. So, so the critical dates, such as when it is created or revised. Um, it might include copyright, um, the copyright year or the copyright holder. Or it might include something like product version, release and modification information. At the element level, you usually use attributes to specify metadata. <clears throat> By default, DITA provides you with three attributes that support filtering or conditional processing. They are audience, 
product and platform. So you can always add more filtering attributes through specialization. In this example, we see one of the steps has the audience attribute set to novice. To generate output for an expert level audience, you can then filter out any elements where the audience attribute contains novice. So here's an example of <clears throat> metadata at the map level. At the map level, you can specify metadata in a topic meta element, which contains metadata elements about the entire map. This is similar to the prologue element in topics. Topic ref elements also can contain metadata in attributes. This metadata allows you to do things like suppress entire topics when you generate output. In this example, we see an example of the author element, just as in the top, uh, sorry, we see the author element in the topic meta. And this is just as we saw in the topic metadata example. The audience attribute is here again with the audience equals novice. This time it indicates the entire domestic duck species topic is only appropriate for novices. So it should be filtered out when you produce ex, um, output for expert users. If you need additional or different filtering attributes, your information architect will specialize to define additional metadata. Some common requirements are you might want customer specific information, you might want region specific information, <clears throat> or you might want product family information. For example, information applies to a group of products. Now that we've seen topics and maps, how do we generate output? Most content delivery is in the form of HTML or PDF files rather than data files. To get output, you apply style sheets to the data files to create HTML, PDF, or other formats. This process is called transformation. One way to transform the content from data into output is by using the Data Open Toolkit. The Data Open Toolkit is a collection of style sheets mostly written in extensible style sheet language, XSL, and they provide a starting point for creating output. But the default output from an unmodified data open toolkit transformation is notoriously unattractive. Using an organization will modify, so, sorry, usually an organization will modify the transforms to enhance the output so that it then uses the organization's look and feel before being put into production. The open toolkit is not the only way of generating output from data. You can use commercial tools to create output. Some tools provide only publishing support, others provide authoring support for your data content. A map file does not have a specific transformation. You can apply many different transforms to a single map file. For example, you could run the same map through transforms for a PDF and for an online help system and get two outputs. Earlier, we talked about how data content creation exists separately from formatting. Transformation is where you apply the formatting layer to get your final output. We also talked about how this aspect of data means you can generate multiple outputs from a single source. The transformation process is how you accomplish this. Usually, there is one transformation per output. So let's take a look at some examples of what different output might look like. On the left, we have the wild duck species content formatted for PDF output. On the right, we have the same content formatted for HTML. Transformation for the HTML produces a, a link to the parent topic at the bottom of the topic, whereas we didn't get that same link for PDF output because it wouldn't be needed there. PDF output is usually read sequentially in, in a series of pages. And so to go back to the parent topic, all the user has to do is flip the pages back. For HTML, on the other hand, to go back to the parent topic, the user actually then has to click on this link, wild ducks, to go back to the parent. These examples also show different fonts, colors, spacing, and other formatting that might be appropriate for each of the different outputs. So, this example shows one of the benefits, which is having the ability to provide, to produce multiple outputs from one source. You only need to write the content one time and store it in one place. 
and then you can produce all the output you need from it. And because you have just one source of truth, you know all those outputs will be consistent with each other. So when you have flexible, semantically tagged, reusable content that exists separately from its formatting, as you do in DITA, you have plenty of options and possibilities for how to make your content work for you. So, this is the end of the presentation. Do we have any questions? Simon, if you pass control back to me, that would be great. Oh, okay. There we go. Thank you. If you do have questions, please type them in the questions chat module. Okay, I've got some questions for you, Simon. And if you would, Simon, would you check to be sure that I got full rights back? I'm unable to show the screen on my end. Thanks. Um, I said stop showing screen. I can, uh, why don't you I have make to give me control? There you go. Sorry about that. Thank there. you. In regard to metadata, someone asked, is this what you call attributes? Yes, attributes attributes are used for two different things in data. They're in data. They're used for data. They're they're used for metadata, but also your attributes are used for um, providing additional information about why you're using an element. For example, the topic element, the the note element, um, has a type attribute, and the default for a note element is the note type. But with, you can use the type element to the type attribute. I'm sorry, I'm keep on the. <laughs> I'm tongue tied. You use the type attribute to then specify whether this is a, a, a caution, a warning, um, and a tip, info, anything like that. You also use the attributes in, say, uh, an image element. The attribute href then points off to the file that contains the image that you're using in data. So there's, um, as I say, two different reasons for using metadata, uh, using uh, attributes. Someone asked, what is a submap? A submap is just a map that is referred to from your main map. So, and as I said in the presentation, the submap means you can group a bunch of uh, similar information together in this in this submap, and then reuse it in, in many different places. All it really is is just another map contained within a map. It's hierarchy. This is more of a comment, but it's a very common comment. The biggest difficulty is to be persuasive with management to show that data is a solution to reduce costs and time of creating documentation. Oh yeah, and um, I think it's you know important to know or keep in mind there are, there are a number of different reasons you can uh, point out the advantages of data um, from a cost perspective, and often reuse or translation come up as some major uh, major things major places for cost savings. We do have on our website a calculator to help you figure out how structured content can help you. Go to our website and look under resources for, I believe it's called the XML calculator, and you just type in some numbers and it can spit back more numbers at you to give you some idea on cost savings in regard to some of the things that Simon talked about, translation, reuse, and also a big one is formatting. You're no longer manually applying formatting to all your delivery output types. That's automated, so there's some cost savings there as well. So take a look at that calculator online. I think you'll find that very helpful as well.
And another question, if you were creating a document with background information uh, and a step-by-step -step guide, would you use a concept or would you use a task? Ah, well, those are two different types of information. So I would put all of the background information, concept topics, and I would organize all of my tasks in individual task topics. And then in my map, I could then organize as I wanted to the different topics into whatever order I need for creating my deliverable that would contain that would contain background information and your tasks. And someone asked, can you see everyone's questions? No, you will not see those questions uh, displayed. You'll just hear them as I talk about them and Simon answers them. And there are quite a few, so please be patient. We're going through them as quickly as we can. Please explain the difference between the XML Lang tag and the metadata element you mentioned for language specialization earlier. Uh, actually, th there may be a, a confusion there in the presentation. Uh, they are both the same thing. The XML Lang attribute is the metadata. It's how you, it is metadata, but it's also how you specify what language is used in the topic. Let's see what else we have here. They're just keep coming through. <laughs> Great. Let's see. This is coming from someone working in academia. And the question is, I see that DITA is based on XML. I also know that there are other products such as Markdown and Jekyll. Can you make suggestions for how professors might best learn DITA for teaching purposes? Uh, this person is trying to develop a strategy uh, for moving data and content strategy into the curriculum being taught. Hmm. Well, um, let's see. I, I'd say the first thing to say is that, um, well, you can to learn about data. Of course, there is learningdata.com, which is a good way of learning some of the basics of what data is. And within learningdata.com, come you will find there's a specific course on the learning and training specialization uh, within DITA there is a specialization that allows you to use DITA for um, for encoding learning and training information and this isn't just the um, the actual training content it includes your assessments it includes your planning it includes overviews and these are all put together in a set of a set of modules, or you can use these in a set of modules, and that way you can have much more modular learning information. So uh, check out learningdata.com, and particularly for the questioner, check out the learning and training specialization. Yeah, and I think I would even back up and not even start with data necessarily. I would look at XML and structured authoring in general because mm -hmm. data is just one way to do it, as this person mentioned. Yeah, that's that whole right. concept on its own, working in structure, is a huge leap for people who are particularly so used to working, for example, in a word processing software like Microsoft Word, where you mm -hmm. see all the formatting as you type. It's a huge leap. So right. I would start, you know, looking at XML and structured authoring and then look at how you can do it with data being one of those possibilities. It is a very prevalent possibility, but it is not the only one, the only way to do that stuff. That's right. And one uh, advantage right away over Markdown is just that XML, including data, has this idea of semantic tagging. Whereas you look at a, a Markdown document, you've no idea why you applied bold formatting, whereas in data, you know specifically why bold is being used. Yes. Can you briefly summarize what a complete set of files would look like for a document? The person is asking, for example, do I need a content file, a map file, and a metadata file? No. Um, in, okay. In DITA, um, let's start from the top. In DITA, you have a map file, or um, there's also in DITA a book map file, which is a specialization of map and allows you to do things a little bit more organized way for a book. Um, you can use the bookmap file to um, specify um, your uh, preface, 
Um, you can organize information into chapters. So then within that, you um, have individual data topics, which cover your preface information, all your chapter content, all the um, information in the beginning of the chapter, um, all your concepts, and so on, everything that we went over. Now, things like a table of contents in an index, you don't need files for in DITA because those are, can be both automatically generated from the map. So in the map, in, for the table of contents, the processor goes through the map, finds your individual data topics, pulls the title out, and puts it and formats it in the correct form for the level where, that, um, where it found that title. So for example, if the title was found two levels deep, below in the chapter, it will be formatted correctly as the second level head. And the same thing with the index. You can go, um, data processor will go through your data content, pull out your index information, and then format the index itself. Now, just thinking about the other content that you might need, your, the other content will usually include um, images. So most content usually includes at least one or two images. Some content includes lots of images. So that's another thing that will be in your content. And I know we need to drop some links into the chat. One of my Scriptorium colleagues, please drop a link to the XML calculator in because we have a request for that. I think that would be helpful for people. I also want to share with you a link to the evaluation for this session. We very much want your feedback, so please fill out that form when you see the link appear. Thank you. Uh, another question, is it complicated to start data without a CMS, that's a content management system, especially when you have multi-language requirements? Mm. Yeah, I would say if you have multi-language requirements, probably should also be looking at a content management system or component content management system for helping with your content because you know, it's, it means in the first place you have a great deal of content usually and in the second place it means that um, your organization is, uh, is probably of a magnitude where um, it's reasonable to look at a content management system. Now there is a a wide range in prices uh, and functionality of content management systems. So um, it's possible to work in data without a content management system. We've had one or two clients do it that way. Um, I do it often when I'm creating separate sets of content, but most of our clients find that having the content management system is very useful because it pulls together the authoring, the management of the content, and also the output and um, most, in fact, all content management systems that I can think of also have a component that help you manage um, your export for translation and the re-import of that translated content so it can be reformatted. And I would go even beyond that because a lot of times if you have very heavy uh, localization requirements, you probably also have translation management tools in place and mm -hmm. between the, those translation management tools and your component content management system, uh, those are both things that you have to license, but the savings you can generate from both of those things working together can be impressive. And uh, someone, one of my colleagues did drop the XML business case calculator link in there. Take a look at that link and go through that calculator. It can give you an idea of the kind of cost savings you, uh, that will help pay for these things because yes, you, you can't do this stuff in a vacuum, especially when you start getting a lot of languages uh, or a lot of language requirements. You do, do need tools to support you, uh, but the good thing is if you have a strong business case, the savings can help pay for those costs of those tools. I have a question. Can we convert markdown content into data content for AEM? And that's an Adobe product, by the way, Adobe Experience Manager, which has an add-on that can uh, suck in uh, database XML content. Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the drawbacks of using markdown for your content is it uh, doesn't create, the content is not semantically tagged. And so, the major effort that you'll find in converting from Markdown to DITA is from determining what uh, information is at what level. 
So um, you have to build some smarts into your converter that says, oh, well, this is a this is a bold head and it's um, at the top level. So I'm going to presume that's a first level head. Um, and it, you know, it goes on from there. Um, NIST, uh, lists, nested lists sometimes become real bears for that kind of translation or conversion. Uh, but it is possible, and we have had a number of clients who've been inquiring about this exact same thing. So it's possible, but you have to build a lot of smarts into your converter. Let's see what else we've got here. This is a great question. If an organization is contemplating a long-term plan to move their training content to DITA, what roles besides DITA skilled authors would be needed? Information architect, DITA training for training developers, what else? Um, I think you've, you've hit on the, the major portion, the, the major um, positions that would be required. Um, I think, uh, when you start moving into data and structured content and a CCMS, an, another thing, another position that you're going to need to look at is somebody who is the, um, what I call the content librarian. You need to have uh, a person or perhaps even a group of people who are very aware of what all the content is, where it is, and can, can advise your content creators on where they can maximize their reuse. Um, where existing stuff has been done, where you know where a path has been trod already, so um, it doesn't have to be uh, written or written a second time. Yeah, and another thing you need to think about too: who was going to create and maintain the transforms that Simon talked about? Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a training situation, you've got to think about things like e-learning, uh, possibly PDFs of your training and student guides. Also, whatever you, whatever formats are necessary to be sucked into your e-learning system so it works. So you also have to think about the transformations as well. Who's going to manage those? The good thing is once you've created those, there's not a whole lot you have to do to them until, for example, you slightly change your structure or, for example, you have a rebranding and your company changes the corporate look and feel. You have to change colors and logos and all that sort of stuff that's when you would have to go back in and change those things in your transform. So you do need to account for the expense of creating and maintaining those transformation scenarios. And, and to even add to Alan's comment, you, if you're, you may also need to look at specialization. If you look at specialization, you really do need an information architect who can help you with that specialization. Absolutely. And there, and Simon even mentioned this earlier on, when you do specialize, there is a trickle down in cost. It affects all your tools, your entire tool chain, everything. So you do have to balance the consideration. Is it going to be worth it financially in the long run to make this custom change? Let's see, we have time for one more question. and. I apologize if we did not get to your question. You can also send us questions at experts at learningdata.com. If you're trying to figure out how to best make the data content model fit your content, you're trying to configure data tools or data transforms, please contact us. We'd love to work with you on that sort of stuff. Let me find one last one. And again, I apologize. We have a lot of questions here and we just don't have time to get through them all. Is there a way to integrate data content into the online help of a application such as a Java application? Oh, yes. Um, in fact, DITA has an actual element that helps you support that, which is the, um, the, um, the resource ID element. And so when you create your DITA content, you can provide metadata, which includes an ID, which can be used by your help system for referring to that piece of content. So you might, for example, have a reference topic that uh, provides information about a particular command. And um, from the user interface, they can uh, 
the user can click on a link and get help and go straight to that topic. And the way that that works is um, when the author created your content, they went to the resource ID element and they added the resource ID for that specific topic. Then you um, tie the two together through the programming of your user interface. So that's how you can integrate data. One last question, and it's probably maybe too big to bite off here, but <laughs> in regard to academia, can you speak to the data learning and training specialization? Ah, uh, the data learning and training specialization is fairly well thought out, and um, it's it was organized by people in uh, um, in the learning and training sphere, of course. Um, but they had particular um, ideas in mind about being able to take this learning and training content and use it both for developing courses, developing content in a modular way, and then being able to take that same information and move it online. So you can take that information and transform it into the input for a, um, a learning management system. You can, you, you can convert the content into, say, SCORM which is a standard for transporting learning information and import the SCORM file into your learning uh, and management system. So um, I'm trying to think of anything else to really speak. We've, we've talked already a little bit about learning and training specialization. I would say again, go look at the um, learningdata.com session on learning and training. There is also a, a good amount of information in the data, data specification itself. And if you Google data specification 1.3, then you will you can find then much more information about learning and training specialization, its basis, and how it can be used for creating reusable modules of training information. And our learningdata.com site, by the way, is based on the learning and training specialization. All of the content that all of the course, both the assessment and the course content are derived from the learning and training specialization structure. So if you want to see one way that the learning and tra training specialization is used in real life, take a look at that website because the source files behind that content is based on the learning and training specialization. And with that, we're going to wrap up this session because we have another one coming up in a few moments.